Hello and welcome to my 1000 subscribers Q&A video. So if any of you guys have watched the first video I uploaded on this channel, I talked about some of the goals I'd set for this channel, and I think a lot of them I feel pretty happy that I have achieved. I wanted to have a place where I could talk more about my feelings about gender, document my transition, and kind of have a little bit of a diary space for myself, even though I acknowledge that it's sort of a very public diary. And that's kind of how I've used this channel. I have really loved how much engagement I've gotten in the comments, and I have loved that I've grown to have a thousand subscribers. There's something obviously flattering about the fact that a thousand people want to listen to me, or now I guess more like a thousand two hundred, but I also think that there's a like literal difference in the way that these videos work now that I have more subscribers, because I can have people yeah, have discussions in the comments, respond to each other, there's sort of like a community thing that's going on, and I think that's really awesome. I wanted to answer kind of like more random questions about myself, um, now that I have sort of a real set of people watching me, uh, which is cool. Um, so I got a bunch of questions, which is awesome, and some of them are serious and some of them are more casual, so I'm going to kind of alternate between serious and casual questions, um, and just use this as an opportunity to ramble, which is great, because as you guys know, I really like rambling, um, and clearly some people like listening to me ramble, so. Alright, so one person asked if I did my undergraduate, master's, and PhD degrees at the same university and all in econ. Also, if I'm looking to the left, it's because this is where my laptop is, where I have the questions. Um, the answer is no. I did my undergrad at a school which also has an econ PhD program there, and I definitely considered going to the econ PhD program there, but when I talked to my advisors, who I really like loved and respected, they were like, Arthur, we've had such a great time having you in class and working with you as a student, but you like need to get more experiences, you need to talk to new people, see a new city, you know, have, have a new set of advisors, so they recommended I go to a different program. I actually did not do a master's first, and my current program doesn't have a master's affiliated with it, so I'm just gonna get a PhD at the end. Yes, so my PhD is in econ, and my undergrad degree I did a major in math and a major in econ. In order to get into econ PhD programs, you have to really assert, like, I really know math, I'm really smart, uh, and even though ultimately my research doesn't involve actually a ton of math, I sort of had to get a math major, I think, to get into this place, for better or for worse. Someone says, I'm currently trying to figure out this mess that is gender identity, and one of the things I notice being worried about when it comes to transitioning is losing my cis-seeming privilege. And they talk about how they're worried about ending up on the streets and unemployment and all the various things that can come with not passing or being visibly trans. And also being worried about how, like, women might relate to them differently if they transition. And they ask, what was my experience with that? Um, so it is unquestionably a thing that I thought about. Uh, when I was applying to graduate programs, it was really unclear to me what the climate within economics would be around my transition. So I had not transitioned my senior year of undergrad when I was applying for PhD programs. And so I applied under my old name, and then I was sort of like, surprise! And I was so worried about this that I debated taking time off in between. So like, accepting an offer from a program saying, hey, I gotta take a gap year for medical reasons, and then arriving fully transitioned. I think that there's a world in which that was the right choice for me. So it's not like I can sit here and say like, you always have to take the leap and you always have to know what I did actually was, I asked around, I talked with a few professors who I trusted, they gave me people to talk to, I talked with LGBT people, and I got a sense about what the climate would be like and whether it would be safe for me to transition and whether I was risking things related to my career and then I went for it and I didn't take my gap year. There's a world in which I had those same conversations and I got the sense that like, oh my god, things are going to be really bad, I need to transition until I'm passing and then arrive. And that would have been the right choice for me. So I think that these are like really real considerations and I think it's like awesome that you're thinking about them now because transition is awesome and it's like a great time, but it can be all that much more better if you have a good plan going into it about like how the rest of your life is going to get impacted. And so I guess my advice is like, for these different concerns about like finding housing, finding jobs, not ending up on the street, is, is to try to like get a sense about what the climate would be like if you do make the choice to transition. So see if you can find other LGBT people to talk to, you know, get a job that you're happy with, see, you know, what is the climate like at your, you know, with, with your employer, maybe search out a job that is LGBT friendly, and line those things up in place, and then like, your transition will just be all that much more smooth. Yeah, so with regards to the trust and community um, of female peers, so this was something I did worry about, um, because it would be a big change. And I don't know, I think everyone's experience with this is different. My, my biggest sense of dysphoria has always kind of been social dysphoria, and I was shocked at how much better I felt like my social life got after I transitioned. I had been in a lot of female-only spaces, as I think was the case for many, you know, born female people, and I was like, oh my god, what's life gonna be like when I lose these? 
uh, better for me. <laughs> I, I didn't fit in those spaces, fit in into those spaces, and I thought that was because I'm awkward or because of whatever, and maybe to an extent it was, but I think also it's because I'm male. Like, and even when I had long blonde hair, and even when I was at my most feminine, I just, it just didn't work for me. And so now I'll end up in male spaces or mixed gender spaces, and, and they just feel a lot better. I think that the, the only sense that I I find myself missing this sense of community. Is there was something interesting about, so I, I studied macroeconomics within economics, and this is one of the most male-dominated spaces. When I was pre-transition, there's something about being so, like, remarkable, because there were very, very, very few people who looked like me, that I got a lot of attention. I got attention from professors who wanted to provide me guidance and support, which was really wonderful, because they were like, wow, there's no one like this in macro, like, let's support this person. And then I also got, sort of, I was able to form a sort of community of people who were also marginalized in that sense, or, or in common, and that vanished. I look like every other macroeconomist now. I mean, like, I, I'm like, deeply unremarkable. And it feels more correct, but it is quite a shock to go from being someone that's like, wow, like, what an exceptional, like, person, they're so unique for doing what they're doing, to like, I'm just one of the masses. And so I, I do think that I, I missed that in a sense, and that was a bit of a shock, but I personally was surprised by how little I, I missed female um, spaces and relationships. Again, all that being said, varies person by person. There are plenty of trans guys who like deeply miss those spaces or who have to find ways to still be involved in like women dominated social groups. And I don't know, I think about my social group in undergrad, which was largely women. There was one guy, say from like as myself in hindsight, um, who was a straight dude who just really liked having female friends. And he was always the only guy in his friend group and he fit in great. And I think often when you look at groups that are predominantly women, um, friend groups, there'll be one guy two guys, maybe. And so there are plenty of men that, like, learn to operate in that role of being, like, the only guy in X. And so that's also totally a viable option, I think. And it's hard, and I think it's something one needs to think about in advance and be prepared for the possibility that, like, this is an uncommon thing, but, but you can totally, with an active effort, preserve your ability to hang out with women and be in, like, largely female spaces if it ends up being something that is still important to you. All right, so someone else asks, who paid for my egg freezing procedure? So there's a complexity here in that I thought my egg freezing procedure was going to be covered by insurance. There's a bit of a whole, I don't say drama, but um, if I was on my student insurance plan, it would have been covered, but my parents had asked me to waive my student insurance plan because I was covered under their insurance, and understandably they didn't want to like pay the the extra premium on that. But the reason that was frustrating to me is that that decision to waive that insurance, that they then had me pay for the egg freezing, and I didn't realize when I was waiving my student insurance like that I was making an actual financial decision like about myself and about medical things for me. Like, it just didn't even occur to me because I hadn't had a large medical expense before. Yeah, so egg freezing is expensive. It was on the order of top surgery, so um, over $10,000, um, but not much over $10,000. I was able to pay for that because one, my parents paid for college, so I didn't, I was not in debt. And then two, as an economics and math major, I worked in finance for a few summers. Um, and the and <laughs> internships at the top finance places pay like a shocking amount of money. Uh, so uh, I made for two different summers each over like $10,000 each. So I was, yeah, able to pay for egg freezing myself, but like that was a serious amount of money for me. But I feel like, again, worth it. On the, on the order of top surgery, I was definitely like in this headspace where I was like, I'd rather freeze my eggs, do top surgery later. As it turns out, now my insurance totally covers top surgery, so no cost there. Uh, someone else asks a question that I think, I don't know if they were being serious, but I'll answer it nevertheless, which is say, how do I have such great hair? I have a real answer. So one is that, um, to an extent, people were always saying my hair was great pre-testosterone, um, and I have always used this one same product. Um, let me grab from my bath. I'll take grab it. Um, it says, I don't even know if it's gonna focus. It's not gonna focus, I don't know. I don't know how to operate a camera. Anyways, it is um, Hair Mud by by Ted Baker. My mom got it at one of those like random like Martin's uh, Ocean State job lot, the you know Christmas tree at shop. Like you know those random shops that sell like random mom junk. Anyway, she got me this one year for Christmas, and it's amazing. And I use like so little of it. Like I've been using this for like a couple years now, and it's like this sort of like mud putty stuff. And so every time after I shower, I put some in my hair, and then it like gives my hair a texture. And then the other part of the answer is that my hair has changed a lot in testosterone. Um, so it used to be totally flat. And now there's like, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, there are little curls going on. So I think that made my hair look pretty sick. So that's the answer. Someone else asks, how do I balance grad school and social life? The answer is, for me, this is convenient because there's a weird mix that happens uh, between one's social life and grad school because um, being in the economics academic community is, there's like a lot of networking and a lot of sort of 
half social, half academic stuff that goes on. Um, and this is because the, the work is really collaborative. So you will either end up co-authoring papers with other people, in which case you got to get along with those people, at least to some extent. Or if you're not co-authoring papers, you're going to like want to, um, you know, you might have work that's quite similar to someone else. And so you want their feedback on your project and you want to bounce ideas off of people. And so for some people, Mentally, those kinds of conversations where you're hanging out with someone, but they're also an economist, and maybe you're mostly talking about like a reality TV show, but then from time to time, an idea about how to think about like the theory of economic growth comes up, and then you're gonna like talk a little bit about that. Uh, for some people, those register as like sort of work interactions, like they need to like fully get off the grid in order to decompress. In my case, I love those kinds of hangouts. I love existing in the social space where it's like we're 90% social but 10% economics. And so I don't end up needing, I mean my balance, I end up feeling like I have a really, really vibrant social life because I spend a lot of time on things that are not just like problem sets and um, literally doing research. I spend a lot of time shooting the shit with people. But it turns out that kind of ends up with lots of ideas and lots of like collaborative work and I'm kind of... I don't know, I say infamous, but I have like a lot of joint projects going on with people and that's just in part because I really like this sort of social econ experience. Another question is, uh, any things I miss about my life pre-transition or pre-coming out? Um, Pre-T or pre-coming out? So I've actually, I got asked this question a bunch before. I, I had so many, I, I had so many doubts about going into transition and I think ultimately I've just been so shocked at how like excellently it's gone. I really, really, really strongly prefer my life now to my life then. And it's, it's a lot of factors, sure, but I think transition has enabled me to be like a really confident, happy person. And so I sort of end up kind of like hunting for needles in a haystack when I think about things that I miss. But there are some things, and the answer that I most commonly give is that I really did like that pre-transition, if I wanted to look like hot, I knew what to do. There is like cookie cutter like recipe that I had really mastered for if you're a, if you're trying to look like a hot feminine girl. And this was nice because like sometimes I want to go out to a party and be like, look, I'm trying to look hot. I'm trying to hook up with people. And you can just like signal that so easily. I would like wear like a full face of makeup, do things to my hair, wear a push-up bra and wear like a shorter like, I don't know, shorter clothing than I normally would, which all feels kind of ridiculous to describe now, but I knew exactly what I was doing and it was so easy. I don't know, as a guy, there's like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I mean, there's like no, <laughs> I mean, it, I think a lot of people enjoy this because it's like when it's a formal event, it's like women have to do like all this stuff and a guy's like, you just put on a tie. But sometimes I miss this, right? Like sometimes I want to go to a party and I want people to really know, like, I'm trying to look hot. I want to look sexy. And yeah, I, I have my nice, like, I have my button downs and I have my, like, I'll, sometimes I'll do like a, like, you know, I don't know, really like open shirt, <laughs> but it doesn't really work the same as it used to. I guess the only other thing I can think is that there's some extent to which gender occupies more of my headspace. And even though I'm not in that doubt phase anymore, the doubt was very like heavy and hard to deal with. And so there's something nice before coming out to myself where I, I just had suppressed it all and like suppressing things was a little bit easier in a sense. And there's like a lot of like headache transition elements that I certainly think about. My passport application uh, just got rejected because I filled the wrong form because genders, whatever, whatever, like that kind of thing. Didn't need to think about that pre-transition. But like these all just feel so minor relative to like how surprisingly awesome transition has been for me. So I don't, I don't find myself reminiscing the whole lot. Someone else asked, is Arthur actually my name or is it a pseudonym? Uh, yes, Arthur is my real legal first name. It is not a pseudonym. So someone says that they're losing their grandfather and that when they thought they were trans that he was the person they were most scared of coming out, losing by coming out. And was there a person like that on my journey? There were lots of people I was scared to come out to. I think I was scared about, especially because I was uncertain about myself. Like I, I am the kind of person where like I, I had to get here and to be so happy to know that it was the right choice for me. Um, and so it was kind of weird when I was at the very start of my transition to be like making some declaration, which is like, I'm a man now and it's gonna be great. And I know it's gonna be awesome. Like when I didn't know that myself, I was kind of taking, I was taking a leap of faith in some sense. And so I was worried a lot about justifying to people that leap of faith. A lot about talking about that to my parents, I think, but it, it wasn't as bad as I thought. And ultimately I was surprised that even my extended relatives who are, I have some extended relatives that are quite conservative were really, really wonderful about my transition. Like my uncle sent me this incredibly heartfelt email about how he like wishes he got to know me better and like in some sense because he was like surprised I came out. Um, and he again was quite conservative so I, I was just shocked. And I, I try to think about people that I, it's more the fear I think of losing people that affected me. Like the fear of talking to 
coming out to professors, of coming out to friends, of coming out to my family. I was just every step I was worried, and that really weighed on me, even though the outcome was mostly fine. I think that I probably have a few friends that don't talk to me anymore because I transitioned, but these people weren't that close to me because if they were, they wouldn't do that. And I don't know at the end of the day. It's kind of a weird thing to be like, is that person not responding to my messages because they're weirded out that I'm trans or just because they're busy? I don't know, and I think that the, <laughs> I think that my guess is like one or two at least, but I don't know, I wouldn't count those as like deep losses. They, they, I don't think they cared about me. Someone else asks, when I say that I'm bottoming, do I differentiate from like PIV or anal? They say, I only ask because I thought bottom was used only in terms of anal, but now I'm thinking that's very heteronormative of me to conceptualize it that way. No, so I don't differentiate. I use bottoming to refer to two men having sex. I'm not actually sure how I, I how would I refer to it if, um, I was talking about a man and woman. I'm not really sure. Um, I guess I guess technically bottoming and topping applies there, but typically I associate it with two men having sex and bottoming with being the receptive partner, regardless of which hole you're using. Um, the, the, the answer for one's curiosities. In my case, it means both <laughs> or, or either, I suppose. I, th I think it's interesting, a lot of trans guys on YouTube will talk about bottoming, but then are a little bit cagey about what they mean. But I, I don't really care. You, you can know that. That's fine. Internet, hello. What are my thoughts on the increasing number of trans youth? I, I think that um, this is an interesting question. I certainly have a lot of young trans people that are watching my channel, which I know because you guys comment. Um, and I think that um, people are really eager to raise alarm bells about the fact that there are more trans youths now than there used to be, which is definitely true. And I don't know, I'm not that worried. <laughs> I I think that it is certainly the case that any decision you're making around transition, be it social transition, medical transition, um, and especially the ones that are more permanent, um, should be made really thoughtfully. Um, but I think that the gatekeeping around youths who are medically transitioning is like, is pretty good. I think about myself, so like, I think an easy thing that a lot of adult trans people talk about, like worrying about young trans people is they say like, well, I myself, I'm happy I transitioned as an adult. I shouldn't have transitioned as a child. I'm happy I had like my adult brain to make that choice. And that is all true for me. I'm really happy I transitioned as an adult. That was the right choice for me. But I think that I would not have been allowed to have been trans to, to like medically have transitioned as a child. Like, th th I mean, there are there are criteria about like persistence and clarity um, that you have to meet as a as a young person that I wouldn't have met because I shouldn't have transitioned as a child. I mean, I thought about transitioning in high school. I was kind of flip floppy on it. I was flip floppy on my gender presentation. I went back and forth. Like, I I wouldn't have met the criteria. And so I think that it's not like that story of like I shouldn't have and therefore isn't relevant because. I think that it should be an option for some trans kids and that it should be well gatekept and that ideally with the right set of gatekeeping, the trans kids who should medically transition will and those who shouldn't will wait till adulthood. And I think there's, I, I might make a video about it some, at some point, but like, I absolutely think there's nothing wrong with delaying transition even if you think you're trans. Like, I thought I was trans at high school, I chose to transition later, I'm really happy I did, I think it was the right choice for me. And then I think there are certainly going to be some trans kids who use labels they won't use going forward. I don't know, who cares? I mean, like, <laughs> there are all sorts of identity labels that you pick as a young person that you then shed, and especially with the sort of, like, Tumblr gender labels, like, yeah, like, I don't know that that, that kid that's identifying as, like, demi-boy gender flux at age 40 is gonna identify as such, but, like, that might speak to them right now, and if it speaks to them right now, I, who cares? It, it's just a word. Kids, you, like, young people use words all the time, and words can have great power, and you can change your identity over time, and, like, this is fine. I, at one point, identified as bisexual, and that felt really important to me, and that totally spoke to me and was correct for a very long time. Now I identify as gay, and I don't think there was anything, like, incorrect or wrong about the time I was bisexual, in part because I wasn't making a permanent commitment there, right? Like, it was just an identity. And for a lot of young trans people, they're not making permanent medical choices, they're choosing an identity, and that's fine. It's, like, perfectly healthy and normal. What, so someone asked, what is studying economics like? Pros, cons, what is the content like? Skills you use it frequently for? And what do I plan on doing with my qualification after I'm done with my PhD? Um, so after I'm done with my PhD, the hope is that I'll become a professor. And uh, as a professor, you obviously have some amount of that role where you're teaching, but there's also a significant amount of it that's continuing to do economics research. What is economics research? <laughs> I might do a whole video about this at some point. Essentially, it's, it's trying to answer really precisely a lot of questions um, that come up in day-to-day -day life. So I guess I can talk about I'll talk a little bit about a project I'm like actively working on at the moment. We know that when people get laid off, um, some of them will return home to live with their parents. What are the impacts of that? Like, is that the right choice for people? You can imagine that if you're living in New York City, you get laid off and you re return home to rural Tennessee. When you try to get a new job in rural Tennessee, you might get a much worse job than had you stayed in New York. 
But on the other hand, your rent is free, you're living with your parents, maybe you'll return to New York when you have the money, maybe it's a good opportunity to save up, you won't lose that many skills, and you can just hop back right where you were in New York. So it's just kind of an unanswered question. You know, myself and my co-author are trying to understand, like, precisely what will be the causal, meaning, like, um, a literal cause and effect, but the causal effect of um, moving home on your future labor market outcomes. And so economists study all sorts of questions. We want to know what is the impact of taxation? How do we know which economies are going to grow in the long term and which ones won't grow? How does regulation impact whether businesses are going to start up or not? How much does education impact the amount that you'll earn in the future? And these kind of questions, yeah, just come up in day-to-day -day life. I mean, when you're choosing to go to college, in some sense, you're making a guess about the fact that it's going to pay off. And economists have to answer, like, is that true? And the answer is yes. But, um, and so I think economics is really cool because it's kind of quantifying a lot of, like, day-to-day -day things that you already find yourself thinking about and getting, like, a real answer to those questions. Um, and you have to be really clever. You have to, you know, you have to be really in tune with the real world, which is nice. I think there's some sense where I have some friends who are doing research in, in lab sciences, like, say, biology or chemistry, where you can just be in your lab all day, 24-7. And as an economist, you can't really. I mean, a famous, so, like, a an economist who literally just won the Nobel Prize, he actually worked as an Uber driver for some point of time because he wanted to understand, like, how Uber drivers like, think and work, and so he had to actually have that real-world experience to then do this research. Um, and so there's something cool about having to be really in touch with the real world, but then also doing serious academic research. That, that's what I like about economics. Um, I guess uh, cons... I mean, I'm, I'm really a big fan of economics, <laughs> um, but I, I guess there's some sense in which um, it's... Uh, the field is becoming very hard, so there's like very high expectations nowadays for like, even if you have a really good answer using one methodology, like let's say I just looked at the data and I saw that my answer was correct, you're also expected to come up with a theory and you're also expected to like do a bunch of coding. Um, so there's some sense in which to get research, the bar has become really high for people to trust you. And maybe that's not ideal. Maybe it was nice that like several decades ago, economics research, you know, you could kind of explain very thoughtfully a reason why people might behave the way that they behave, and people might be like, wow, that's so great, we can learn a lot from that. And now you have to write like a hundred page paper with all these different strategies in order for people to trust it, so. Okay, how do I support myself as a student? Luckily, I am paid as a student, so grad students receive a graduate student stipend in almost all cases. In my case, that's true. For the first two years, I don't have to do anything to get that stipend, I just get a check every week. Not every week, every other week in my bank account, which is awesome. Um, and then there on after, I have some teaching duties where I will have to be a TA, um, and uh, so I will have to work for my work for my graduate student stipend. Um, but that's great; it, it's more than enough for me to live on. Um, so that's been awesome. Two final questions. So one is: Do some trans men think of themselves as trans men, and some think of themselves as men? What are the difference? Um, yeah, no, I think that's definitely the case. I think of trans man as it's sort of its own. Like social role or experience, right? Like, it's the you you grew up having lived as female, and then you had a transition, and then you lived as male, and that's sort of the experience of being a trans man. I think the I, the notion of just identifying as a man is sort of like a like okay, I I being trans is less relevant to my day to day experience, and so the predominant thing to me is that I'm a man. And I think at times I feel both, right? Like. I definitely feel like I'm a trans man. I feel like my transition was super important to me. Um, but then there are many settings where the fact I transitioned is totally irrelevant. Um, and the fact that I'm a man is entirely less relevant. So I think it's context by context. So like if, I, if I'm trying to talk about something like, um, if I'm talking with women about having had certain experiences, then it's totally relevant I'm a trans man. If we're trying to like do some question about diversity within my field within economics, every single person reads me as a man, and so, like, I don't think I should count as any sort of special sense of diversity, even though I'm a trans man. I think, functionally, I am just a man. And